You are listening to the Hello Lakeshore podcast sponsored by Siler Brothers Construction. And today we have a very special show. We will be talking to two people. Um, we still are kind of doing interviews over the phone. And our guests are Darla LeClaire and Jen Ann. So we'll be talking with Darla first. My name is Ruby and with me as always is Mr. Craig Dillon. Craig Dillon. So today we're going to talk about art in mm-hmm. our community. That's right. So let's jump right into the show. Today we are talking with Darla LeClaire. She is the owner of the art gallery Basil Ishkabibbles. In Two Rivers, she is also a city council member as well as the co-host of a video podcast, Two Rivers Talks. Welcome, Darla. Thank you. It's so nice to be back, and I'm glad you guys are back because I missed you. What's going on right now is an exhibit that Basil uh, is putting on in conjunction with the Lakeshore Artists Guild. And it's called Art is Poetry, Poetry is Art. And it's kind of a call and response type of relationship between the written word and visual art. There were poets who wrote poems that inspired artists to paint pictures. And there were paintings that were created to inspire poets to write new poetry. And it it turned out beautifully. To me, it was amazing. I participated as well as putting it on. To see a beautiful piece of art inspired by one of my poems was it was a real thrill and then I also had a piece that I did it was called Agnes Um, it was a watercolor and that inspired a poem and it was so cool to see how somebody else would interpret your vision so there they are companion pieces to each other you're gonna have to come down the show runs through July 10th come on over to two rivers and see us now we are going to do some phone work here and we are going to connect with Jen Ann, who is a member of the Lakeshore Artists Guild. She is also a big part in putting together the Art as Poetry, Poetry as Art exhibit. Jen, are you there? Good morning. Hi guys, how are you? Good morning. All oh, we're, you know, hanging on in there. Jen, if you could tell us, um, just give us a little bit of information and background of the art exhibit that is going on. On. I did um, visit the website and it's amazing. So hopefully we'll share that Thank with you guys you. later. Um, I did. I did that too. That was finished. Yeah, last night. I loved it. <laughs> I was looking through it and I was like, oh my goodness. But tell us a little bit about what is art as poetry, poetry as art. Wouldn't it be cool if artists made art and poets wrote poems and then they sort of traded each other's work and then they made a new work inspired by that work. I was looking through um, some of the artworks featured for that exhibit on the website and there were just a lot of different, it's not just paintings, it's paintings and sculptures, there's textiles in there as well. Yeah. There was one, I can't remember what it was called, if it was called frosting or... Uh, oh, candy? With the, spr- candy, candy, with the candy sprinkles? Where you just want to like eat it? Yeah, it looked <laughs> really yummy. I don't, I'm not sure what it was made out of, but it just looked really delicious. <laughs> but there's yeah. a lot of different things there and the poetry too. Most of the poets and artists were from the area, so Manitowoc, Sheboygan, Green Bay. Um, There's a couple of people from Madison, and there were two poets from California. What was your experience as an artist or writing um, poetry? Did you find it easy or hard to pull um, inspiration from another person's work? So at first, I thought, oh, this is going to be easy and not in a way um, that, oh, the poem is boring or anything. Actually, mine was about a broken dishwasher when you were talking about you could pass the person by in the grocery store and they could be one of the artists. That's what I really like about the subjects of the poems and the art is some of them are very, you know, contemplative and big questions about spirituality and the universe. And some of them are like this one where it's, frustration over the dishwasher being broken again. Jen Ann with us here on Hello Lakeshore here this morning. Hey Jen, we appreciate the time and uh, and a little bit of insight as well as to what made this whole thing tick. Thank you. It was great to talk with you guys. This has been Hello Lakeshore sponsored by Siler Brothers Construction. We will see you guys again next time. Bye, Bye now.
Here's a, this is an interesting question because I'm dying to hear your answer. Because right. I have my own opinion on this, but I drink a lot of wine. But <laughs> where did the idea for art as poetry, poetry as art originate? Well, um, so two, kind of two places, right? Because I was involved in a um, similar thing through Sheboygan Visual Arts several years ago. And um, really enjoyed it, thought it was a very cool concept. But then last year, after our slam, you and I were chatting, and I was thinking, uh, I don't know how you and I got on the subject, but I was just thinking, um, you know, we have so many poets in this area, and poetry's been a, a part of art slam, and wouldn't it be cool to combine that and have a show? So, and somehow you and I talked and, and got onto it from there. What exactly is art as poetry, poetry as art, and how did the process work? Like spaghetti. <laughs> we tried to help people understand it, but when you're trying to explain it, well, and that's also kind of the inspiration. If I'm, the reason I'm doing this is like, here's a piece of art, here's a poet, here, here's a poem, here's another piece of art, here's a poem, and they all, they connect with each other in different ways. Right. Uh, so what it is, getting back to your question, elementally is, I still really like what you said, and I think it was we were putting it up, and you said call and response. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, holla, 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 well, you don't say the same thing, so I wish I could come up with a better analogy, but yeah, the creation of one, you know, and then the reflecting on it, and the creation of something else after reflecting on the original thing. Like when I was very first explaining it to people last fall, they were like, well, but they've already created the art, but wait, then when are they? And it, okay, so it's like back, you know, six months from today, 15 artists and 15 poets each gave us a piece of work that they already had done. Um, and then each artist was matched with a poem and each poet was matched with a piece of art and then they got six months. That's what I think helps me clarify it to be able to illustrate it. Describe, um, Art is poetry, poetry is art in three words. Oh, that was the hardest question. I know. I was like, do that. Um, imaginative, collaborative, and then I kind of just threw a blank. <laughs> it's like exciting. That works, yeah. absolutely. It's on you. I'm going to stick with call and response. That three words, girl. <laughs> It's three words and it's descriptive. <laughs> Don't you give me that look. Sneaky snake. Okay. <laughs> Boy, you really, you really squeaked out of that one. Uh, that that was the hardest question of my it was. <sighs> but I understand the I understand the purpose of it to like boil it down to just yeah, just and that, that is difficult to do, that's why I think I asked. <laughs> How did you envision this type of initiative and what we ended up with is we had huge input into what we ended up doing. I wasn't really sure. <laughs> it was spaghetti in my head. But I'm like, let's just go forth and see mm -hmm. what happens. I think I was, in, in my mind, uh, maybe this sounds weird, but I think I had the website was clearer to me than the actual, because it was simpler, it's just digital. You know, it's just right. boom, art, art, boom, boom, art, art, boom. I had no idea what it was to be like. How does this exhibit benefit the participants? And what do you think it will do for the community? And the community being Manitowoc County. So participants, and I heard, I felt this myself, and I heard it from the people that I talked to while they were doing it, is the challenge. Most of the rest of the stuff that we make as artists, it's, it's ideas that come from your own head or things that happen to you, which is great, but sometimes you get in a rut or just, that's one thing I enjoy about taking classes is you're exposed to somebody else's, you know, momentum and idea and you have to do that and that can shake things loose in you in the rest of your practice. Um, and it might be, they, the people I talked to seem to be interested that this was more collaborative, like, you know. Okay. Yeah, like I even had somebody ask me, like, do people do that all the time? And I'm like, not that I know of, and that's why this is this. That's why this idea appealed to us. Um, I think it it benefits, uh, like Jen said, in terms of it. It gets you to kind of think outside of your little box and 
um, in terms of the subject matter, in terms of um, the media even. Like, I do some collage, but not a lot of collage, and on this one, collage just worked for me. I, I was surprised home. when I saw that. Yeah. I wasn't expecting it. Yeah, she even said, she's like, well, where's Cheryl's other piece? And isn't it stitched back? And I'm like, no, she actually, it's a collage. Yeah. I love it. I oh, just thanks. absolutely love it. <laughs> yeah. But so that was kind of getting out of your comfort zone just right. a little bit. Something that you enjoy doing, but it's not your go to yeah. technique. Yeah. Yes. And I think, um, again, like you said earlier, it, it benefits the artist just in terms of having something positive to do and to look forward to, especially in times like these. Yeah. And, um, you know, it just it benefits also just in terms of like the exhibit and putting your art out there and, and putting yourself out there. Right. Collaboration is really um, unique to this show, and, and it's just such an important aspect, you know, of, of again, getting out of your comfort zone right. and working, being challenged by somebody else. And How did you feel when you first read the poem that your artwork inspired? Um, so the first thing is, I'm like always flattered that somebody picked me. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, pick me, pick me. And, um, and the artwork itself is pretty abstract, right? And so Emily wrote this poem that has very specific imagery. I mean, when you read her poem, she like pulled out some of the colors that I used and focused on some of that stuff and made it all flow together, which title of the artwork. But but just the specific imagery, you know, I could see it in my mind when I was reading through her poem. So I just thought, how cool is this? Scootering on the pavement beneath a full moon and snow stars, a child says, someone is reading a book about us. What? The mother says, slightly alarmed, mostly cold, although they both wear snow pants beneath puffer coats. Insulated mitten touches smaller insulated mitten for a moment. The moon is like a flashlight, the child says, a flashlight someone is using right now to read a story about us. The child glides on a Spider-Man scooter a while longer. The mom paces around the pavement where their mobile home used to be, across from where their cozy ranch farmhouse now glows. In five minutes, the mom will whisk them both inside for hot cocoa. She'll stir the instant mix with mini marshmallows. After milking, the father will stoke the wood stove in the kitchen. The rest of their evening, and maybe their lives will be chaotic, but joyfully so. Constant warnings about catapulting off of furniture. But for now, they enjoy a few glittering moments under the eye of some alien flashlight. The mom pacing in her red moon boots, imagining her pink puffball hat and their pink cheeks in illustrated form on some matte page, screen, in an intergalactic storybook. Moments are meant to be stolen. They must be stolen as they are too briefly hello and so quickly goodbye. Snatch them like crickets and put them in a box. Savor the stale crust. Sliver the fresh almond. Scrapbook the grain of sand. People, people, they disappear. They disappear as do we all. Inhale the wisps of smoke from their extinguished candles. Pocket the fading glow. Pack away the pale vapor. Preserve the fleeting essence. Travel, indulge, tisk tisk and twirl. Tread fearlessly from morn to morn, as this is the life and this is the death. Enunciate every silly vowel that stutters and hum every consonant that whispers. Hear the growing laughter and stunted weeping inside each of your cells. Laugh at the preposterous. Weep only at poorly placed periods. Ignore all the nonsense. Accept your reality with a smile. The best part of my morning is hearing you breathe. The moment of sleep cycle, not slumber, not wake. 
the muffling sound of life draws me to the surface. In the fog of transition, I heard a voice before the touch. Soon my lover is beside me, lying his chest to my back. Big arm surrounds my torso, wiggling me into his flesh. I sense his inhale, taking in my scent. I come closer to morning. It is then I recall that sound, which first reeled me today. On soft breath, he had said, the best part of my morning is hearing you breathe. Though it rains, September yellows, turns reeds into rattles that echo the throaty call of sandhill cranes. Though it rains, goldenrod sways, thistle split, spill cottony seeds. Near the tracks, pink hips swell on the regosa, ready themselves for the wax wings. Though tomorrow may rain, today light reflects gold, offers one more chance to tramp the green grass before October's frost. Because nothing stops September, gather it with me now. We'll hug it in the coming months while rain beats overhead and night floats into our room, humming lullabies. Children come to spot the alligator, run around the pool in front of the nature center, and out toward the Everglades, whooping and growling, showing off their youthful fearlessness. But we were here for silence in the face of expectation, the knowledge that our world would become splintered sometime soon. The gator slid through the waterways, almost unseen. Our parents were getting old. They took us to Loxahatchee the way foreigners show tourists the sights. Northerners, they were fascinated especially by the birds. The Anhinga perched on a skeleton tree, spreading its wet wings dangerously in the sun. The coots strutting in the muddy bottom lands and great blue herons dancers on tender legs, spearing prey with their bills. One late afternoon, buzzards gathered near the viewing platform, and a hot wind thrust itself in our chests, a warning to measure the land, our delicate place, the painful balance in wildness. How lonely is the story without birds and the wild land and fresh sky gone. No more forests and fields for strolling. Every bee erased and its flower bouquets. A tight island, our conversation now. Our dreams full of hurried stick figures. A Punch and Judy show, where only we are the foreground, and we the horizon. Only we in the textbooks, where we stride across engineered turf, talking through our glowing devices. Let me tremble like a flower in the moonlight. Open my petals slowly, reveal my vulnerability in your luminescent grass. Fall down upon the soft carpet of grass in the garden of the gods. Eros would be envious of your prowess, Aphrodite jealous of your skill, and I, I am Psyche searching for my love, to whom I am bound for eternity. Are you my love? Your serious moonlight seduces me, shackles my heart to you, relinquishes my soul, all that is in it. Like a butterfly, I wrap my wings around you, kiss your soft lips, gaze into majestic eyes, succumb to love's lustful caress. 
in this garden of the gods, under the moonlight, I lose myself, no desire to return. How like kites we are, always chasing the invisible, our tail into pale blue. We climb alone with eyes like hearts, soaring and falling, as if seeking some unknown summit, with our tails out, carefree, prone to shift our position. We shove, heave in every new direction. We clear these imaginary obstacles, seek greater glory, until, too battered by a life, of hapless navigating, hopeful to not crash, float back down to magnetic ground. Maybe we never set course again, safe in the boy's closet. How like kites. Solid or speckled, fragile as life, yet stronger than you think. Design perfection and calcium carbonate with protein adhesive. Any stronger and nothing could get in or out. And yet it's the pieces we think of. The absent breakfast or baby. The Humpty Dumpty, mysterious shards on the sidewalk. Somewhere, a full belly or empty nest. A grieving species, a path we dread to walk. Pampas grass, pom-pom chrysanthemums, dandelion fluff, all hugs their stems so tightly that they do not move, unless you blow really hard. And even then, only the fluffiest of dandelion might wave hello, but probably not. Styled in teeny tiny bunny tails, decorated with candy that you savor instead of eat. So sweet are your braids and puffs and teeny weeny afros with bows and barrettes and beads and parts. It thrills with power when I set a lit match to its wound cotton wick. It realizes its strength to light the darkness surges its flame with energy, grants me permission to set my world aglow. The dishwasher broke down again. The damn thing just won't drain. Fetid water lines the basin, built in obsolescent pain. Piece of rice, bit of glass, pinpointing the root of calamity. Malfunctioning pain in the ass, a manufacturing calumny. The damn tech's gonna exert his will, charge a hundred just to show, add another inconvenient bill, hemorrhaging household budget woe. The consumer hostage just can't win. Time to open up the checkbook again. You believe he is the brine you float in, saturated seeing green through clear glass like spring, each bud a knot in your throat. You pucker up the tang of him sour, full of vinegar, obscurely fermented. He laughs at the face you make, but kisses you anyway. Your spiny fruit softens in his good salt, tasting vaguely of the sea he came from. You are cured, you think. The black and white typeface, indelible marks of an old Smith Corona. The envelope musty, weathered, the things we keep, the things forgotten. This is a form of hieroglyphics, the slow crossing, words pounded out on paper, cousin to cave walls. Each generation makes its fossil advances, inches forward, words, pictures. Thoughts flutter, distracted butterflies. The letter dates me. The slap of that like stepping out of a lukewarm shower in winter. Thin towel. Shifting my backpack in line, eager to wait. I may as well write about a wagon train marking its slow advance. Creak of wheels, 
dusty bonnet, or an old metal lantern, corroded, filmy glass, but still something that lighted someone's way. The things we keep are not always what we imagine we'll find. For days, each leaf of grass has sent its body's slant capsule into air, the joyous green leaf that still stays home. And this morning, dew. Drops clustered and singular are shining song, points of light in a field of light. I stand here in the middle of my lawn, in the middle of my life, feeling the altar call to praise. In my mind, an expansive field of saints, network of glistening souls. All around me, this lattice work, touch points where worlds fit together. How we hold, how we hold hands with the living and the dead. I stand with all I love, all I have loved. We are beads of light in the endless reach. Smothered in white bone, struggles the soul to freedom, rogue chaos to flee. Feathery heavy, to strain, to heave, ravage and rest, in dry tears and sweat. Linear and neat, no longer are we this day, the dawning of loss, endure. Water gushes to rock, that I am with you ever, that I endeavor to lunge and fall over walls of magma, cooled and grayed, ripe for my cascades. You do not thwart me, the spider silk and true of me, the ruckus and renew of me, splits and trips over your promontory. I zing and zoom in praise of you, Satin winks over stones, freshets burst free. Your cracks and crests amuse me. Rainbows bounce between the vapor beads of our infinite capacity. Earth struck a tree into your igneous skin and commanded me to rush into radiance, to break through and in and out of you. Mother began as a tidy person, hair primped just so for Sundays, neck scarves tied according to photos in her high school home ecbook. She'd rip out every crooked seam we sewed on the old singer, scrubbed our hair three times with kerosene when we brought home mitts ironed even the sheets, though the wind flattened them pretty well on the line. The day young Mel left for Vietnam, she washed every window, including the cupola, the way up little room we never went to. Always told us cleaning something was the start to fixing everything when he returned in a cast bed. She let the flower beds go first, and the daisies spread out helter skelter. Took years before her vegetable rows came back somewhat straight, for her skirt pleats to be almost crisp. It was like mud had won out. While the tumor did its slow dance, borderline the word during that long term, she would go to the garden, sit on her short stool, and sift the loosened soil through her fingers, no gloves. 
said she liked the warmth of them, the way it anchored everything, trees, houses, and people, that it was what we lived on. She'd laugh whenever we pointed out the dirt under her nails. In the midst of a party, she likes to sit and observe, floating in the flow. Her grandmother floated in a glider chair next to a crystal dish of rosaries, a bowl of ripe grapes. On stage in another lifetime, a cloud of aqua blue sprays from the granddaughter's mouth, becomes tulle. She plucks a few notes now and then, though the violin floats on purple carpeting beneath her bed of dust. She's confusing flow with float now, on her back on a giant inner tube beneath clouds, drifting. In a children's atlas, a picture of a geyser in Iceland, all those teal fluid lines, hot and cold, sunrise and dusk, all that heat bursting upwards. She floats enveloped by emerald green slices of earth. How to erupt so beautifully. After work, she walks farther and farther away until she is a tiny glass bead. Or she crawls into a snow cave and closes the door. Inside, everything is ice blue. She closes her eyes and floats in a queen-size bed with fleece blankets. Sunrise. A streak of orange and then pink. She checks again and it's more of a coral or peach, electric. As she washes her hands, a single lavender bud from the bar of soap, floating in the flow. Leaves crinkle beneath my hikers while red, orange, and yellow spatter tree limbs. Autumn sunshine, although bright, cheery, darkens change and pushes me to do the same. Looking outward, I see the necessary change inward. Crisp aromas inhale deeply, exhale the old and welcome the new. Cool air replaces warm breezes that once danced across my skin. Geese command the sky in strict military formation, their own change moving across the wind. My well-worn path is now blanketed with old fixtures of summer days gone by. A crackle of movement interrupts this meeting with myself. I pause, admiring nature's beauty among the trees. Two does anticipate my next move. Their pause, much different than mine, reveals their own path of change in an unlikely, uncertain time of year. Starling mermations twisting, swirling in uncontrolled hysteria litter the sky as I return to the field where my meeting began. There are many visions along any path, past the village, along willy grass gill, up and down the ladder stiles towards Lingy End, through the woods climbing the stone staircase. Once over the hill, Rock gives way to heather, bracken, bog, the lake in the distance clear as sky. The sheep are hefted in these parts, meaning their sense of belonging has been passed from you to lamb. And in a sense, so are we hefted, returning year after year. Standing here in late September, you might marvel over those hands that stack the stones one by one, whose work underfoot surpasses us. The Urging of Birds Birds and their insistence on singing and sweaters hop the stark trees out my window. Sparrow, hummingbird, winter wren, in a promenade of morning sun, drawing squares of light and shadow on the frozen lawn. An abundance of birds astounds the leafless branches with pattern and sound, 
Argyle, Chevron, Diamond Stripe, Warble, Whistle, Trill, and Chirrup, claw grasping the side by side, twigging, tweeting with buoyancy, an undeniable twitter in the throat of being. Stand here by two birch trees before water. Follow the lean of their papery bark. If hope can be held closely in the bucket of the heart, then it can be left to flow freely, like tracing echoes of formless words into sand, the sound and shape of small waves erasing. Trace again. What is the most downward bending branch, like a dousing rod, trying to tell us how would we be if we lost any part of the hand one fresh water lake for each finger superior michigan huron erie and ontario the names roll off the tongue slip between branches land with whisper on the ground vivid green leaves today at a distance A young girl with a long black braid, blue top, and white skirt flew by on a freestyle scooter, following a dirt path, as if hope, besides being held within the heart, propelled her, trailing from her shoulders like wings. As if the path will lead here, two birch trees before water, where she might prop her scooter against one trunk, find a small patch of soft ground or sand in which to smudge her thumb, earth's oil paints, palette of lake's edge, shaping again, anew. The green of life is behind me now. The hill path I walked with you is empty. I am empty and alone. I am so alone. Shades of black encompass my mind, my body. I cross my lamb fleece white arms, clutch myself, and fold myself, remembering your embrace. My hair is lank, dust ochre as the soil, the earth heaped upon you. Through a veil of tears, my dark eyes stare blankly at this morning, this morning. Cumulus clouds overhead, holy are their existence. Weather dock over riverbed invites your presence. The tree stands waiting for buds, years of seasons it has witnessed, Love abounds in this place. Breathe in and pause at its reverence. Hear the unseen crickets creaking, chirping birds from hidden nests. Inhale the scent of evergreens. Step gingerly on spongy mosses. Take the Lord's hand through the tall grasses. He allows you to stumble as you offer the course forgiveness. Carry forth this gifted day. Do not shrink in its vastness. Behold, as in this space, in you is greatness. The city's been shrouded in white and shut down. I shiver, distressed by winter's erasure of all that I love. But look. Scattered across the snow are glistening gems in colors I can taste. Spearmint and bubblegum, lemon and grape and cosmic raspberry. I want to ingest these festive pebbles, but what if they're poison, unicorn scat, or mystical seeds that might grow a whole garden of earthly delights in my belly? What if I get to decide what if? Now, they are sprinkles on a cake we've yet to cut. Each day is a birthday. Let us light candles and sing of how luscious life is, even now, when everything looks different, is too much despite all that's missing, 
and all the sweet shiny things we crave could be bad for us. In that airborne instant, something jump wonderful has just occurred. A leap, a gleam in me, and I too sing the body electric. My core is lightning, chalk stretch, all hollows birch. I am the home of muscle and heat. Splinters of brilliance twist in me. I am a clean leap from gravity in a posture of joy. I'm lift and thrash, white and raucous, as wheat glinting in sun and wind. All around me, molten tones. An amethyst expanse moving outward to color the air. In me, jolt, jounce, powerful reverie. I dance to my pulse. Smashing eggshell into the side of a red Teflon pan, blazing. The flat iron land, not yet hot enough. Skull imploding, already dead when finally delivered to evaporation point during our nuclear winter. My empty remains discarded, unborn I ride inside man-made coated steel. Slither and fry, yellow at the core, a baby who never arrived, just one of twelve created at factory, carried home from that morgue called the grocery store. You couldn't escape the wet heat of summer. Picking cotton in antebellum Louisiana, it is still the land of cotton. You can even visit and tour the Frogmore Plantation in Louisiana where cotton is still king. And though they removed the Jefferson Davis statue from the center of town, it is still there in a dark warehouse waiting. How can a plant so soft be the root of something so ugly? Oh, Captain, my Captain, you've got me riffing on Whitman, rendering leaves of grass, creating verses for a body electric. Oh, Captain, my Captain, you've got me rethinking history, counting up costs of battles won and lost, wondering if we can learn not to repeat ourselves. Oh, Captain, my Captain, you've got me remembering Williams, standing on desk chairs, summoning dead poets to life. Oh, Captain, my Captain. Thank you.